Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving GRE math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the revised GRE, the second edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. We are almost done solving all the math problems from this book. If there is a problem that gives you difficulty, and if you're interested in watching the solutions to the problem, you will find all the solutions from day number 251 through 400. From 251 through 400. This book happens to contain exact same problems in most cases and appearing on exactly the same page numbers again in almost all the cases as the ones that appeared in the first edition of the revised GRE. We are finished doing all the problems from this book. If you are interested in watching any of the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. The original solutions tend to be a little lengthier and they tend to be a little bit more in depth. Right now, we are in the process of solving some quantitative comparison questions. Quantitative comparison questions are very important and they are still a very big chunk of the exam. Unfortunately, the new books, the revised GRE books, do not provide us enough practice questions for quantitative comparison questions. For that reason, starting from day number 401, we began solving problem out of, problems out of this book, the quantitative comparison problems out of this book, the 10th edition of the general GRE. Right now, we are on page number 266. Let's, let's turn to it. Problem number 14 on the page, the penultimate problem on the page, number 14. As soon as I finish setting up the problem, oh, it's already there. The problem is already on the blackboard. And I was about to say that as soon as I finish setting up the problem, you must pause the video. You must always do this thing, even if I don't remind you, pause the video immediately, solve the problem yourself, and then compare your work against the work we do together. Do you understand? This problem, problem number 14, when it appeared in the exam, just to give you some idea as to where it, where it stands in terms of difficulty, little over half the people got it wrong. Here's what the problem says. It says in a class of 30 students, number of seniors, number of seniors is three more, number of seniors is, number of seniors is three more, number of seniors is three more than twice the juniors. And, we are told, and three tenth of them are, three tenth of them are neither junior nor seniors. And what we are being asked to compare the two quantities, in column A we have, we have number of juniors, and in column B, 6. That's what it is. They're simply asking us, do we have fewer than, more than, or equal to 6 number of kids who are juniors? I'll give you 5 seconds. I'll get out of your way now to pause and unpause the video and solve the problem yourself. Now here we go. There are two unknown quantities here, number of juniors and number of seniors. Since there are two unknown quantities, we need two equations. We need two independent equations to figure out the values of these variables, number of juniors and number of seniors. And that's exactly what we have to do here. There really isn't any, any, any way around it. We really don't like to compute anything. But here there is no way around it because they want you to compare number of juniors versus 6. Now we could actually put 6 in there and see if it works or not. We could do that and if it answer is C then we are done. But if the answer turns out not to be C then you will end up wasting more time trying to figure out whether it's A or B. If you like, we can do it both ways. Let's first do the classical way, shall we? Let's do the classical way. So we need two equations, and the question is, where, is, where are these two equations going to come from? To which the answer lies into the fact that the equations are, what are equations? Equations are simple sentences. Languages are made up of sentences. In the language of algebra, a sentence is called an equation. So as long as we have two sentences in this statement, we are all set. We can translate those two sentences into two equations. Let's see if we have two sentences here. Or perhaps we can break up the two, a, a given sentence into two parts. It says in a class of 30 students, well right there is your, right there that tells you something. Right there is, 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 is something here. A class of 30 students, it says, the number of seniors, the number of seniors, number of seniors, number of seniors, let's call it S, is, is means equals, number of seniors, number of senior is three more, three more, three more means plus three, three more, three more than what, three more than twice the junior, twice the junior. Now, if we didn't have this three more part, 
If you didn't have this three more part, then now the sentence reads, now the sentence reads, the number of senior is, is means equal, number of senior is twice the number of juniors. That's not the case. It's number of seniors is not twice the juniors. It is three more than twice the senior. We need to add three. That's our first sentence. That's our first sentence. The second sentence is that we are told that three tenth, three tenth of them are neither junior nor seniors. Let's find out what three tenth of thirty is. Three tenth of thirty. Zeros cancel out, and that's nine. Nine are neither junior nor seniors. Now, what does that tell us? Well, that implies that implies that twenty-one of them, twenty-one of them are either juniors or seniors. If we were to add up, if we were to add up the number of juniors and the number of seniors, it has to add up to twenty-one. Because we are told that not. Three tenth of them are neither juniors nor seniors. Three tenth of uh, thirty is nine. Nine of them are neither juniors nor seniors. If nine of them are neither juniors or seniors, then the remaining twenty-one in the class must be either a junior or a senior. Therefore, junior number of junior plus number of senior equals twenty-one. There you go. These are our two two, two equations here, and we just have to solve for it. We are interested in J, so let's substitute S from here into this thing. This equation tells us that S equals to twenty-one minus J. Twenty-one minus J. We're going to put it. We're going to put the value of s in here. So s equals 21 minus j. Where can we continue? S equals 21 minus j right here. So s equals 2j plus 3, and we just found out that s equals 21 minus j, which is same as 2j, which is equal to 2j plus 3. Bring the j to that side, you'll end up with 3j, and bring the 3 to this side, you'll end up with 18. There you go. 3j equals 18, and therefore j equals 6. What do you know? J equals 6. The answer is C. Answer to this problem is C. That's all. Now, another way we could have done it actually is to see, uh, try our luck and see if the answer is C. Let's do it that way. We just pretend that the number of junior is 6. We know that they have to add up to. We know that they have to add up to 21. Okay. So here's another way. Let's do it here. Junior plus seniors. They have to add up to 21. That we do know. That we do know. So if we pretend that the number of junior is six, then six plus seniors would have to be 21. That tells us the number of senior would have to be 21 minus six. That will be 15. And the question is, is 15 three more than two times the junior? The answer is yes. 15. 15 is two times the number of juniors plus the three. Number of senior, number of senior is in fact three more than two times the junior. That's that's what the first statement told us. Number of seniors is number of seniors is three more. Number of seniors is three more, three more than twice juniors. So it fits. So we could have done it that way as well. Anyway, we end up ended up taking too much time on it. It shouldn't be like this. Let's go to the next one, shall we? Number. Number fifteen. Number fifteen. Number fifteen. When it appeared in the exam, when it appeared in the exam, only twenty-eight percent of the people got it right. Almost three quarters of the people who took the exam had trouble with it. Here is what it says. Column A, we have a quantity of 4x squared plus 4y squared. 4x squared plus 4y squared. And in column B, we have a quantity of 2x plus 2y whole squared. I'll give you five seconds to pause and unpause the video, and I would like you to do it yourself. Okay? Make sure you do it yourself, and then we'll compare the work. Here we go. 4x squared plus 4y squared versus 2x plus 2y whole squared. Let's open this parenthesis. When we open this parenthesis, we get 4x squared plus is is 
a squared, a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, so we get 2 times 2x times 2y. 2, 2 times 2x times 2y, we'll end up with 8xy plus 4y squared. Are you with me in the story? We see 4x squared on this side, we see 4x squared in the other column. When we subtract that quantity from both columns, it plays no role. 4x squared appears in both columns, it plays no role. For example, for example, if you tell me, if you tell me that 7 is more than 5, well then 7 is more than 5. 7 is more than 5. Adding, adding 2 to both sides is not going to play any role. It's not going to change the fact that this quantity is still more than that quantity. 2 plus 7 is still more than 5 plus 2. The play 2, 2 plays no role. It's not going to change the fact that if column A is bigger, column, will remain, column A is going to remain bigger if you add up, if you add the same quantities to both columns. That's what it is. It appears here, it appears there. Let's subtract 4x, let's subtract 4x squared from both sides, from both columns. It goes away. I see 4y squared here, I see 4y squared here. Let's subtract 4y squared from both sides. Okay, let's do it different ways so we can keep, this, keep them separate. That's it. And what are we left with? What are we left with? 4y squared is gone. What are we left with here on this column? We're left with a big fat zero versus what? Big fat zero versus big fat zero versus 8xy versus 8xy. What do we do next? Well, what we have to understand here is that what we have to understand here is a simple fact that if if x or y or both if x or y or both equal to 0, then this quantity would be 0. Because 8 times 0 would be 0. 8 times 0 it would be a 0 times, right, if x or y or both of them are 0, then this quantity would be 0. In that case, the answer would be C. In that case, the answer would be C. On the other hand, on the other hand, if x and y, if x and y, if x and y are not 0, if x and y, they both have to be non-zero. If one of them is zero, the answer is going to be C. If either x or y is zero, the answer is going to be C. Or they're both zero, the answer is going to be C. If it turns out that neither of them is zero, if x and y, they are both not equal to zero, then what? Then the answer is not C. We're done. It doesn't matter what the answer is. We know for a fact that as long as x and y are not zero, they may be positive, they may be negative, they may be fraction, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What matters is the fact that as long as they are not zero, the answer is not going to be C. Before it was C, before when one of them or both of them were zero, the answer was C, and now it is not. Therefore, the answer is D. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.